Good morning and welcome to the FSR webinar entitled A New EU Energy Technology Policy Towards 2050, Which Way to Go? And will be presented today by Sophia Rooster, a research fellow and the Think Project Team Leader at Florence Curve Regulation. My name is Magdalena Mosch and I'm a training coordinator at Florence School of Regulation and I will be also moderating today's webinar. And before we will connect with our today's speaker, I will point out a couple of issues regarding the webinar agenda. In the first point, I will briefly explain also the control panel that you can see right now in the upper right corner of your computer screen. Then we'll be able to proceed with presentation of Sophia Rooster. Right after that, we will start the Q&A section. In this section, uh, our today's speaker will answer for the questions submitted by the audience, and I will briefly explain how you can submit your questions in just a couple of seconds. And then I will conclude today's webinar with just some final announcements. Okay, so this is the control panel that you can see right now on your computer screen. I would like to just point out a couple of features um, in this control panel. So the first one is this uh, tiny little orange arrow. Therefore, if you would like to, for instance, follow our today's webinar on your full computer screen, you can just click here and uh, it will basically allow you to follow today's webinar on your computer screen. But if you would like to use a couple of other features on this control panel, you can always click in the same place and the control panel will reopen. However, if you would like to, uh, for instance, check on something on the internet or something on your computer, you can click on the button below and this is to minimize the window. It means that the entire webinar will be basically minimized and the task on the, your taskbar will remain the webinar icon. Okay, and below there's the hand rise tool, therefore I would like you to use it right now and if you can see my presentation on your computer screen and if you can hear me, just please click here and I will know that we can proceed to um, the presentation of Sophia Rooster. I can see that you are clicking right now, I will wait a little bit longer. Okay, I think that everything is fine. However, if you have any technical issues and uh, however, if you have maybe some questions, technical questions during the webinar, you can use the question box here below in your control panel. This is also a place where you can submit the questions to Sophia Rooster and we will try to answer for as many questions as possible. Please remember that we have very limited time for the Q&A, therefore, um, please remember to, to submit very brief questions. One last announcement is that the recording and the PDF from today's webinar will be available on our uh, website on Friday and also the recording will be available or on our YouTube channel also on Friday. Okay, so right now it's time to unmute Sophia Rooster and I will do this right now. Good morning, Sophia, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Magdalena. Hello, good morning, everybody. Perfect. Okay, so Sophia, right now I will connect to your computer screen. I am doing, doing this right now. And I think that we'll be able to see your presentation in just a couple of seconds. Perfect. I can see your presentation. Therefore, I leave you the floor and I will connect back to you in around 40 minutes. Good luck. Thank you very much. So the topic of today's webinar is a new EU energy technology policy towards 2050, which way to go? Well, actually, during the past months, we could read a lot about challenges that the European green tech sector faces and that might decrease incentives to innovate in the area of low carbon technologies. So, for instance, we could read about current austerity and whether this might derail Europe's clean energy movement. And some governments are actually reconsidering what they and their taxpayers can afford in terms of green energy initiative. And so some countries like, for instance, Greece or France have cut subsidies to solar power in the very recent past. And we also could uh, read a lot about the threat of a possible trade war between China and the EU. When a group of uh, European solar panel, produ panel producers uh, lodged an anti-dumping complaint and accused China of giving out immense subsidies to help its own industries to gain market share also in Europe by selling the products at artificially low prices. But beside these new challenges of an increasing global competition and also beside the consequences of the financial crisis, the current EU energy technology policy framework with the existing SET plan is also running out in 2020. And 
so there's no doubt that a new and stable policy is needed. And so our THINK report, which has been actually published this morning on our website, develops and discusses a renewed EU energy technology policy that can help to not only achieve the 2020 targets, but that also can pave the way towards 2050. This webinar has three main parts. I will first briefly introduce the background of this report. Then I will introduce different possible policy paths for a new EU energy technology policy and we'll also talk about whether a certain policy might be superior to the others. And finally, I will present you our recommendations for EU technology push and for a renewed set plan given that we have to act in a very uncertain policy context. So why was this uh, very important to do this analysis? Um, the general EU policy goal is to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 80 to 95 percent below the 1990 levels by 2050 and the achievement of this objective will of course not only depend on the let's say greenness of energy or on uh, improvements in energy efficiency and overall energy consumed, but it will also depend on the economic growth and the energy intensity of this growth. But what does this target actually mean? What does it imply? Um, it first implies that um, other sectors, like for instance the transportation sector, have to be at least partly electrified too. Uh, even though actually today it's very uncertain at which pace and to what extent this will happen and this becomes also quite clear if you have a look at these forecasts regarding the penetration of electric vehicles. There are very strong deviations from a possible baseline uh, case into both optimistic and pessimistic directions already for 2020 which is not so far away. So every policy must actually allow for such electrification. And all this also implies that uh, given that a certain level of emissions in non-energy sectors like the agricultural sector is not avoidable, that the electricity sector has to be quasi fully decarbonized by 2050. Decarbonization can be achieved in different ways. We first have consumption-oriented measures, which includes an increase in energy efficiency of buildings, of appliances, of cars, etc., but which also includes behavioral changes, so um, just consuming less and energy conservation. And on the other hand, we have production-oriented measures, which includes low carbon generation, where we have renewables, but also nuclear, as well as the decarbonization of fossil fuels with carbon capture and sequestration. But there's huge uncertainty regarding the 2050 electricity system. Um, 2020 is basically tomorrow and the technology paths are roughly known. But for the midterm future already, these paths become more and more uncertain and in the longer term, they are basically unknown. And actually this uncertainty does not only stem from internal factors like national policies or R&D done within the EU, but it also comes from or is influenced by external factors like the technology development outside the EU or phenomena like the global financial crisis. And how can we achieve this uh, decarbonization by 2050? Well, the Energy Roadmap 2050 presents a variety of ways to reach this 2050 objective. And one could be a diversified technology scenario where all types of technologies, so including renewables, nuclear, CCS, but also energy efficiency improvements play a role. And the key driver would be a strong carbon price. But there also could be other scenarios, like for instance, a high renewable scenario, which would rely on a very strong push for renewable technologies, or for instance, a low nuclear case, or maybe even a high energy efficiency scenario, which would uh, rely on much more political commitment and stronger requirements and obligations. But of course, it's very important to keep in mind that the European Commission itself cannot determine the way how we go to 2050, but that the energy transition instead will primarily result from countless private decisions on energy supply and use, which is shaped by the entrepreneurial actions of private innovators. 
Several stakeholders developed their own roadmaps. We have, for instance, the European Climate Foundation, the IEA, Greenpeace or Euroelectric. And they differ regarding their assumptions and regarding the concrete baseline and 2050 scenarios, but they have what is quite interesting, some aspects in common. <clears throat> so energy efficiency improvements in all cases are of very high importance. And on the production side, three main variables remain, namely the shares of renewables, nuclear and CCS. And so you see that any policy decision which is related to a nuclear phase out or for instance also to the support of the deployment of CCS will have a huge impact on the respective scenario outcomes. But in any case, uh, a policy towards 2050 should ideally always be as cost efficient as possible and it also of course should foster European competitiveness. But uh, why do we now need a new EU energy technology policy? Um, first of all, there are at least four kinds of reasons for policy intervention in general. So we have the environmental externality related to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And then there are also innovation externalities since the overall economic value of innovation to the society is typically much larger than the economic benefits for the innovating firm and so there are these so-called spillover effects and the related appropriability problem. But there are also capital market imperfections, so investors are constrained in capital and in these times it's very difficult to raise money in general and it's even difficult for some actors like especially small firms to get access to available funds. Uh, but also, for instance, the timing of returns could be an issue, so it might just take too long for an investor until the benefits uh, can be monetized. And finally, we also have uh, the issue of increasing global competition, and the, today's challenge is to remain at the forefront of a booming international market at a time when member states curtail their public spendings. And so you see that policy intervention can be motivated by market failures on the one hand or also by strategic trade and policy issues on the other. And regarding this last issue, I would like to ask you for your opinion now. What do you think about this increasing global competition in green tech sectors? Is it a threat for European innovators? and for European low carbon technology manufacturers or is it maybe instead also a motivation for European firms to become more efficient, to innovate and also a possibility to discover and benefit from new business models. I open the poll now and I would like to ask you to choose now up to three of these possible answers. What do you think uh, about this increasing global competition. I will wait a uh, few more seconds. We already have about a uh, quarter of you who gave their choice. It seems to be a very difficult question where it's not so easy to spontaneously say what you think about it, but I can already see that there seems to be a certain tendency. I actually did not expect. I wait a few seconds more and then I will show you the results. So, okay, I will close the poll now and surprisingly the picture is a quite positive one. Actually, I thought that uh, the audience would uh, have a more pessimistic view on global competition, which is also reflected in uh, the news and in the public opinion. We can hear a lot about that. Um, of course, I cannot tell you now what the kind of right answers are to this question because this certainly will also depend on the concrete situation in a specific industry. But um, let me um, give you some more input for further thinking on that issue. In the wind industry, top turbine manufacturers saw a continuous reduction in their global market share. And this is also a trend which is very likely a trend that will continue. But it's actually only European manufacturers which are active in the offshore wind market today. 
And so this might actually be a chance to use this advantage of being a pioneer and to build a competitive advantage and so to benefit from domestic technology adoption but also from exporting the technology to other non-European markets. And in the solar PV sector, you all know that China has become the global manufacturer. But uh, similarly, again, there's a part of the value chain where it's European firms that are dominant. So it's, in this case, solar PV manufacturing equipment. And this is actually a high-tech segment where it's quite difficult to outsource that to low-cost countries. And so again, there might be an argument for public support to keep this competitive advantage. Existing policies that aim at supporting the development and deployment of low carbon technologies have some obvious limitations. So first, we currently do not have uh, one single and adequate carbon price yet. The EU ETS covers only a subset of emissions and prices are also argued to be too low and too volatile. And we also have heterogeneity of national approaches regarding the treatment of non-ETS sectors and renewable support policies. And there are also these interactions between the various policies and measures that are implemented to support the achievement of the 2020-20 targets. Second, the EU's Strategic Energy Technology or SET plan worked actually quite well to bring stakeholders together during the last now already more or less 15 years to have a more coordinated planning to join forces but it has a limited time horizon and it also builds on a within sector approach regarding planning and priority setting so everything is done within these so-called European industry initiatives where we have one for solar, one for wind, one for CCS, one for nuclear etc. So the current set plan does not necessarily support a cost efficient portfolio of low carbon technologies yet. And finally, the current policies also do not yet present adequate remedies to address the new context with the financial crisis and the increasing global competition. So what are possible policy paths then for a new EU energy technology policy? Such policies can be described using a kind of toolkit we first have market pool instruments, which basically one can say create markets. And here we distinguish between two key uh, in kinds of instruments or classes of instruments. One could either build on strong price signals or in contrast, one could provide uh, quantitative targets to uh, set these incentives and create the markets. Regarding technology push, which is basically direct support to innovation, we distinguish between direct technology push that targets a specific technology and technology neutral support to innovation. And then the governance of these instruments can be either decentralized national or even subnational action, like for instance, national renewable support schemes, or it can be centralized like the EU ETS or EU funding to innovation or also the cross national planning that is currently already done in the set plan. The first path could be the continuation of current policies, uh, which would also mean that we would replicate the set plan for the 2050 horizon, and we could call this policy path a kind of reference case. With respect to market pool, here the policy is based on a mix of incentives coming from carbon pricing on the one hand, and quantitative targets and the related policy instruments to achieve these targets. On the other hand, so we would have this weak carbon price covering only a subset of emissions and we would have EU level targets for renewables and energy efficiency uh, as we have them now for 2020. And we would then have national energy policies which aim to uh, meet these national targets. With respect uh, to technology push, uh, we also would have a hybrid situation uh, with some direct technology push as well as funds for which innovation projects compete. And information exchange planning and priority setting here would happen within these industrial initiatives. And also the governance of these instruments would involve a mix of centralized elements like the EU ETS or the framework programs and decentralized elements mainly those covering non-ETS emissions and uh, renewable support policies. 
So summarizing our reference uh, case would involve a policy where all these elements market pool, technology push and governance would have a hybrid form. But uh, where can we depart from this reference case? Uh, we can actually depart into two polar directions, assuming either a strong or a weak carbon price. So policy path two, departing from a strong carbon price, would rely on this strong price signal and technology neutral support to innovation. Um, so in this case, uh, technologies are discovered by the market. And for policy path three, in contrast, uh, we would rely on quantitative sectoral targets and directed technology push uh, that aims to support an ex-ante determined optimal portfolio. Let me summarize what these different policy paths would require from a set plan now. For the reference case, the set plan would, as it is today, uh, be a platform for open access information, uh, for coordination and cooperation between stakeholders, and it also would be the basis for planning and priority setting. For the second policy path, um, the set plan basically would function in a light version as a platform for uh, open access information and coordination and cooperation. And so it would become preliminary a tool that can help potential innovators to take the right decisions and it also can help to uh, mobilize funds. For policy part three, in contrast, we would see an advanced set plan that would also function as the basis for technology target setting. And the planning and priority setting would happen across sectors and so the allocation of funds would be based on a kind of predetermined optimal technology portfolio. Now I would like to ask you again for your opinion. What do you think now? Which policy path is actually superior from your point of view? Is it path one, the reference case? Is it the path building on strong price signals? Or in contrast, would it be a path uh, building on um, quantitative uh, targets uh, and uh, directed technology push? I open the poll now and would like to ask you to choose uh, one of these three options. So, this choice seems to be much easier. We have already more than half of the people who took that choice. And there seems to be a path nobody really likes, which is again surprising, because actually I thought that this path would be a quite attractive one. So, and I think I can close the poll now and show you the results. Nearly nobody would like to continue the status quo. So all of you would like to substantially or would prefer to substantially change policies. And then there's quite an indifference between uh, price signals and um, target setting and directed push. So is one policy path now really superior to the others? To this question, I actually can give you an answer. We did assume first that uh, the decarbonization objective can be reached under all policies. And then we did an evaluation of these different policies uh, based on a set of criteria. The first one is green growth. So we were wondering whether the policy does respond to fierce global competition in green tech markets. Then we uh, took, took into consideration the robustness to the EU financial crisis and institutional frictions. We uh, had a look at cost efficiency. Does the policy achieve climate and growth goals at lowest cost? And finally, a criterion which is really important too is implementability. So we wondered whether policies are politically and institutionally feasible and whether there might be barriers to implementation that we would have to expect. Policy path three actually is uh, best able to support green growth because we have the strong role of directed technology push. And we also have the possibility to explicitly support domestic firms. And it allows also public authorities to support selected technologies already in very early stages of the innovation chain. And governments and the EU can explicitly target those technologies where one can build an industrial leadership. 
policy path three is also the most robust to crisis because first of all sectoral targets provide quite stable investment signals and uh, there's also the ability for policymakers to account for different national technology push programs and to adjust the burden of uh, decarbonization among member states uh, whereas with a strong carbon pricing scheme as we have it in policy two, one cannot account in a similar manner for member state heterogeneity. In contrast, uh, policy path two clearly is the most cost efficient solution because abatement costs across all sectors and abatement channels are minimized. For other policy options, one may doubt whether policymakers would have the required information to define targets in a way that it implies cost efficient abatement. But policy path one clearly would be the most easy to implement because uh, if you just continue to do what you do, obviously this is quite easy and implementation efforts uh, would be quite low compared uh, to the other two options. And also subsidiarity compatibility is given. The shared responsibilities between the EU and the member states are fully in line with the shared competences as defined in the EU treaty and in contrast for policy two, one would suffer from severe difficulties to implement high enough carbon price and also to include all greenhouse gases um, into the scheme. And for part three, implementation barriers would mainly relate to achieving an agreement on sectoral targets and on the related burden sharing among member states. And so you see that no single policy is clearly superior to another and the choice of optimal policy will also depend on the political priorities and on the weighting of different evaluation criteria. In this um, third and final part of the webinar, I will now come to our recommendations for a renewed set plan and European technology push given that we are actually in a very uncertain policy context. There are different uncertainties that are not yet recognized in the 2050 roadmap. First, technological revolutions could have an important and unpredictable impact on the available set of and on the relative cost of decarbonization technologies. And so shocks, for instance, like the Fukushima accident can eliminate technology options or technological revolutions could add new means of decarbonization and such a situation could be a global shale gas revolution if we assume that the US would become a large scale exporter of cheap gas and that we also could replicate the US experience in other parts of the world, the rational price of carbon might fall extremely low and uh, shale gas might actually substitute for dirty coal, which is good, but it would also substitute for expensive renewables. But we still have to keep in mind that gas is a fossil fuel and that we need uh, also other technologies to achieve the 2050 decarbonization objective. With shale gas alone, this would not be possible. So you see that in such situations, uh, push for other low carbon technologies is crucial to achieve 2050 targets and it's very risky to only focus on the today's set plan technologies. Furthermore, the EU energy policy um, builds on three pillars. We have sustain, um, sustainability, of course, but we also have competitiveness and supply security. And these alternative policy objectives could actually outrank decarbonization. If uh, the competitiveness objective would rank particularly high on the political agenda, uh, we could expect quite emotional discussions about the possible negative impacts of a unilateral climate policy. And this would obviously hamper the successful implementation of decarbonization policies and especially of carbon pricing schemes uh, of any kind. And uh, if supply security would rank particularly high, um, a balanced portfolio ensuring a well diversified supply mix also would call for a stronger technology push and maybe also for directed push policies in order to get this uh, balanced technology portfolio. Given that uh, none of the presented policy paths is clearly superior to the others and that we act in this very uncertain policy context, a renewed set plan should allow for all possible future policy paths 
And it also should be more focused than the current set plan and provide the basis for planning and prioritization among decarbonization technologies. So similar to the current model, in the first step, stakeholders um, from individual sectors could work together within the European industry initiatives to identify technological progress and future research needs. And then in the second step, uh, priority technologies should be identified based on a comprehensive approach across sectors. And finally, selected technology targets and EU funding should then be in line, of course, with this set plan prioritization. There are several reasons that uh, justify some directed technology push instead of building fully on technology neutral support to innovation. First, um, certain low carbon technologies are key to achieve the 2050 objectives and there are at the same time reasonable concerns that they will not be developed and deployed at the necessary scale or on time. And this could, for instance, be the case for CCS because actually all scenarios in the roadmap have a substantial part of electricity generation using this technology from 2030 onwards already. And if policymakers want this technology to be deployed, probably some further support might be needed in order to overcome the especially non-economic barriers we currently face uh, regarding the deployment of uh, CCS in Europe. And uh, second, European technology push um, also might be a mean to respond to fierce global competition and to help to keep uh, wealth within the EU, um, whereas market pool measures benefit all, so also non-European players, directed technology push can be designed such that it favors domestic players. But uh, there is a very important but. Uh, it's important to be aware the, of the fact that strategic industry and trade policy measures might actually be a possible regret measure. So there's a quite fine line between supporting technologies on the one hand and then subsidizing industries on the other and one has to be very careful here. So and now I would like to ask you again for your opinion. Imagine now you are a European policymaker, and then of course you would have a very tight budget, but you would know that you are able to support the development and deployment of up to two low carbon technologies, not more. Which ones would you push then? Would it be wind? Would it be solar? Would it be a collection of other renewable technologies like uh, ocean energy or geothermal energy? Would it be CCS or would you use your money instead and uh, support energy efficiency enhancing measures. I open this uh, third poll now and I would like to ask you to choose up to two of these uh, five options. The first time that the result seems to be as I uh, did expect it, uh, already two-thirds of you have uh, given their opinion. It's still changing a bit, so I wait a couple of seconds more before I show you the results. Um, there's a certain aspect where you all agree and then there's a strong disagreement regarding the other options. There are still some people voting because I think it seems to be very difficult to, to make the choice here. I wait another couple of seconds. Okay. I close uh, the poll now and show you the results. So what is nice and what I wished to see is that uh, many of you chose the last option of energy efficiency enhancing measures. And then, as I did expect it, actually, there is no clear view on which um, technologies to support when you have to, when you would have to make a choice among wind, solar, CCS, and other renewables. Um, let me say something about our technology specific uh, recommendations because 
um, some issues we uh, could say after we did this analysis. Um, first of all, the prioritization of production-oriented technologies actually bears the risk of uh, picking the wrong winners. And this is especially so because the future market developments like uh, shale gas revolution may completely change the benefits and market value of different production technologies. But uh, the situation is different for um, consumption-oriented technologies, which mainly include energy efficiency improvements and the installation of smart appliances, for instance. And actually, first, as I said at the very beginning of this webinar, there is a consensus that the 2050 objective cannot be reached without significant improvements in energy efficiency. And second, many studies show also that energy efficiency enhancing investments in many cases will amortize very quickly. So pushing consumption-oriented measures seems to be a very good idea. And it's also politically feasible because it benefits all EU industries independent of their geographic location. And the implementation of such measures also is quite labor intensive and jobs will be created throughout all member states. And pushing consumption-oriented measures obviously is also robust with respect to future energy market developments because consuming less uh, always is a good strategy. For similar reasons, also pushing enabling technologies is a no-regret uh, policies. This includes, for instance, smart meters, grids, or ICT infrastructures. But uh, the appropriate magnitude of these investments will depend on the amount and type of renewables that enters the system. And if, for instance, we have a more close look at electricity grids, the optimal system architecture will also depend on whether we move towards a um, system of, let's say, European-wide energy superhighways with uh, solar energy imported from North Africa and uh, a lot of offshore wind in the North Sea or whether instead we move towards a system of rising local energy autonomy, which is also featured by a lot of demand side management and demand response. So here, the concrete design of the system will really depend on, on where we go. But a final aspect to be considered is also the funding of basic R&D. Also, the creation of options is a no-regret policy, and it will not lead to lock-in effects or stranded investments. And actually, for all technologies, be it production-oriented or consumption-oriented technologies that are early in the innovation chain, um, the argument that one or another might be more feasible to be pushed or more likely to create green growth stimuli does actually not apply anymore because the relevant industries do not yet exist and a successful deployment also can be expected only in the longer term but still of course support is required today and uh, this support should build on a broad technology funding because these projects typically entail a very low chance of success, but if they are successful, you would expect a very high payoff. But of course, then over time, and as the probability of success increases, these funds should uh, become more concentrated. So to conclude, um, the 2050 climate objective poses huge challenges on policymakers, and there's no doubt that a new and stable policy design is needed. There are, however, possible futures that are not yet recognized in the EU Energy Roadmap 2050. And uh, no policy path uh, is clearly superior to another. Um, so a renewed post-2020 set plan should therefore allow for all possible future paths. And it should offer the basis for planning and prioritization among decarbonization technologies. And so it should build on a comprehensive approach across sectors to identify key technologies. And um, pushing energy efficiency enhancing and enabling technologies does dominate other uh, push strategies and it's also politically feasible and robust with respect to future market developments. And finally, the creation of options for technology breakthroughs has to be a main pillar of any future set plan. And that's it already from my side. 
I uh, thank you very much for your attention and if you want to learn more about the topic you can also always contact me or have a look into our think report and I am now looking forward to the Q&A section and I will give the microphone now back to Magdalena. Thank you very much Sophia, I really appreciate that you are with us today. I know that it was not easy for you to talk for straight for 40 minutes. And uh, right now, let's just before I will ask you the first question, I would like to say that there were several comments uh, submitted uh, by the audience. And I would like to say that you can email Sophia directly by using the, the email that you can see right now on your computer screen. There were very interesting comments and I think that she will be very curious to know your opinion on this topic. Uh, but right now I will go just straight to the first question that was submitted today. And the first question is, is it a good idea to cut subsidies to solar PV as has happened recently in some countries? Um, yeah, actually this is a, a question which many people are wondering about in these days because it's true it has happened in many countries like for instance uh, Greece or France and I think also Spain and indeed the 2050 climate objective is very challenging and we need a lot of renewables and solar without doubt has to play a role here but it's also true that new technologies need to be gradually integrated into the market and in the long run, we will need a level playing field and policymakers also should be careful to pick winning technologies. Um, but still, of course, to address the, um, the uh, environmental and innovation externalities, public support today also to, uh, to solar PV technologies remains an important uh, part of uh, any energy technology policy, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. So the second question will be, what makes the choice of an optimal policy so difficult? Well, this is a, this is a difficult question. Um, there are, first of all, uh, many trade-offs among these different uh, uh, policy uh, paths or policy options, as I, uh, as I um, explained during the webinar. So, Building on price signals uh, is clearly the most cost-efficient solution, whereas uh, policy building on, on quantitative targets is most suited to support, for instance, green growth uh, in the EU. But just continuing what we do is clearly the most easy to implement. And this actually might be a really, really important factor in, in, re in real life or in real policy making. And, and this implementability issue or the difficulties related to implementation actually probably are the most severe factor making policy choice so difficult because uh, if we, for instance, want to build on strong price signals, we have to have in mind that Europe cannot be treated in isolation and that the unilateral policy can have negative impacts on certain industries and can have negative impacts on certain member states more than on others because they might have a certain um, industry structure and so it's really, really difficult, if not impossible, to implement uh, high enough uh, carbon prices and to include all emissions into the scheme. And in contrast for uh, an option where you would like to uh, set quantitative targets, you would have to be able to um, uh, design these targets or determine these targets. And it's very difficult to um, kind of calculate an optimal technology portfolio because you would have to have all the relevant information and it would be very difficult to agree on these targets because of course every sector would fight for its own um, for its own sector and it would be also very diff difficult to uh, sh uh, achieve a burden sharing uh, among member states and also distributional impacts actually are a factor which has to be considered for any EU energy technology policy because varying impacts on different stakeholders or different member states always uh, make policy choice very, very difficult. And uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I stop, I uh, stop <laughs> well, well, you can make a comment, <laughs> of course. Um, okay, so the next question will be, how should Europe respond to the strong competition from China? Uh, this is also a 
an interesting question. China clearly is a low cost competitor to Europe, but um, maybe the picture is not so pessimistic as we sometimes see it presented or debated uh, because there are various areas or parts of the value chain where European firms still have and can also keep a competitive advantage. And on these areas, we just have to concentrate because we will never be as cheap as China, but uh, we might be really good in R&D and we also might be uh, very good in high-tech segments that uh, then can also be sold to other non-European markets as for instance the solar PV manufacturing equipment I was talking about during the webinar and then we also have to keep in mind that there are many parts of the value chain that just cannot be outsourced and where a lot of innovative and interesting business models could be developed um, like for instance if we stay with uh, within the solar PV sector. There are different aspects related to downstream system integration or to the installation maintenance of solar PV modules and I'm sure that there are still areas where European firms can, uh, can, um, can settle and can um, have a good position. Thank you very much. I think that we still have time for one more question and this question will be when it comes to decentralized versus centralized scenarios, how do you think the future of European energy system will mostly look like? I think it's now is a very uh, secure answer, but, but I really think that it is like that, that it won't be one of these two extreme cases. Um, I really do not think that we will fully build on these kind of highways where we have really a lot of solar energy coming from North Africa and a lot of offshore wind from the North Sea and that this will basically be our future energy system. Um, but I instead think that of course offshore wind and solar from Africa will play a role but that also this uh, increasing penetration of distributed generation uh, we see currently and the increasing use of uh, smart uh, appliances, increasing demand side management, demand response will also play their role and that we really will have a mix where the whole power system somehow also changes because uh, we have these uh, big changes on the supply side also on this very large scale but also a lot of changes on the demand side where consumers suddenly become also a kind of producers because they all have solar panels on their roof and they might have electricity storage systems or air conditioning systems which are able to respond to system needs and so consumers also become active participants in the energy system. And I really think that we go into this direction where we see um, components of both of these models uh, with centralized and decentralized elements, yeah. Thank you very much, Sophia. I think it's time to say goodbye to you. I really appreciate your presentation and the I'm Q &A. very sorry <laughs> for the voice problem and having, but um, yeah. No, you were very brave. Thank, we thank we, you we very all much. really appreciate that. Right now it's time for you to have uh, warm tea with honey and lemon and I will join <laughs> you, I promise, right after I will finish today's <laughs> webinar. Okay, so thank you very much, Sophia. Goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Okay, so right now it's time to conclude today's webinar. So I will just very briefly come back to my computer screen and I will just uh, uh, finish this webinar with final announcements. So as you can see right now on the computer screen, the first announcement is the survey. So right after I will close today's webinar automatically on your computer screen will appear a survey consisted of eight questions. I would really appreciate if you could, um, really, it will take just only two minutes, uh, if you could just fill out this questionnaire uh, because this will help us to evaluate today's session and make some improvements in the future. And the next announcement is that on Friday you will receive a follow-up email from me where I will thank you for participating in today's webinar and in that email you will find the link to our website where on Friday the PDF and the recording from today's webinar will be available. Also the recording will be available on our YouTube channel. We will edit the 
the recording a little bit, so um, it will be slightly shorter than the entire webinar today. Uh, however, you will find it on our website on Friday. Also, in this email, uh, you will find the link to register for the next webinar, and the next webinar will take place on the 30th of April, so we will have a couple of weeks of, of a little break, uh, but we will come back with a new topic, and the new topic is cost-benefit analysis in the context of the energy infrastructure package, and this time this webinar will be presented by Leonardo Meus, who is a part-time professor at the European University Institute and the research fellow and think project scientific coordinator here at Florence School of Regulation. Uh, therefore, if you would like to uh, participate in that webinar, you can uh, even right now go to our website and you can find the registration link out there. And uh, if you go to the trainings and events and if you choose the webinars, uh, basically you will see the list of all our webinars scheduled until July 2013. However, if you go to the video section, you will be able to find all PDFs and all recordings from our previous webinars and you will also find the webinar that Sophia did last year. Okay, but as you know, uh, Florence Corp Regulation is not only about the e-learning trainings, but we also do the residential tech trainings. And the upcoming one is the specialized training course on the regulation of gas markets. The final deadline to register for this training is this Friday, and I have to say that there is still one seat left, so if there's any of you uh, who is interested in this topic, uh, you can register on our website. And the next training is, um, will be the training course on the remit regulation. This is our first training of this kind and, and it will take place in April. This training is only for the energy regulators. However, the last day, the 12th of April, will be the workshop that will be open also to the FSR donors and also to the representatives of European institutions. So the deadline to submit your registration form for this training is 15th of March. And the next training will be the summer school on energy policy and EU law. It will take place at the end of May. And the deadline to register for this one will be 15th of April. And the next upcoming training is the summer school on regulation of energy utilities. In June, uh, the registration form and the program for this training will be available on our website next week. However, if you have uh, right now some questions maybe regarding the webinar or regarding our residential training, you can contact me even right after we finish this webinar. You can see my email right now on your computer screen, so please uh, use it whenever you wish. And also, as we said before, if you have any questions regarding the content of today's webinar, I know that there were many questions submitted and we didn't really have time to answer for all of them, just please use the email that you can see right now computer screen and just uh, contact Sophia directly. Okay, and now it's time to say goodbye. I would like to thank you for joining us today, and I hope that you will do that once again in April or maybe in May. And uh, until then, I want to wish you a wonderful day. Thank you and goodbye.